Path is a great engine, but there aren't a lot of tutorials out there. So in this video, I'll show you how to build this breakout game on Bavi step by step. If you want to start making games with Rust and Bavi, this should help you get started. First, create a new project using Cargo New, then CD into the project and add Bevy as a dependency. Open the project in the text editor of your choice, open the Cargo Tone file, and then just above the dependencies, copy these lines of codes to improve Bevy compile times. The code for this project is on the description of the video. Now type Cargo Run Features Bevy Dynamic Linking, and this will compile Bevy for the first time. It will take a while, but after that, Bevy compiles really fast when you use dynamic linking, just under 3 seconds. I'll also soon release a video on how to improve Bevy iteration times with hot reloading, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. After you're done compiling, you should see hello world on the terminal and you're ready to roll. Go to source, main.rs, and let's set up Bevy by creating a new app. First, we include bevy.prelude, which brings in the most common plugins, functions, components, etc. from Bevy. Then, create a new app by using app.new. Then, add the default plugins. Those are just the most common plugins that you should expect on any engine. Things like logging, transform for handling position rotation, input, window handling, etc. This is actually enough to set up Bevy, but let's also add a system to close the game when we press ask. If you don't know what systems are, don't worry, I'll explain them in a bit. Finally, you can just type .run to run your game. If you go back to the terminal and run the project again with dynamic linking enabled, you should see a black screen, and if you press ask, you'll exit the game. Let's now create our player. On Bevy, we use a entity component system architecture. This means that any object in the game, such as the player, the ball, the brick, is represented by an entity, which is really just an ID that is tied to a group of components. The components themselves are just data for this entity, things like the position, rotation, scale, health, and really any data that makes sense for your game. And finally, the systems are the code that operate on those components to create game behavior, such as a character controller, for example. This is in contrast to a classic object-oriented architecture, where an entity would typically be a class with both data and functions bundled together. I won't go into details on the difference between those two architectures, but if you want to see a video about this, let me know on the comment section below. Back to the code, let's start creating our player by creating a new component named Paddle. This will be a component with no data that we will use to identify the player. We call these tag components. Then let's go up here and add some constants to our player that will specify its position, size, and color. Now we need to create a system to create our player. Go into the main function, add a system called setup on the startup. The startup systems are systems that don't run every frame, but instead only once when the game starts up. Now let's create the setup function. I know this looks like a lot of code, but it's very straightforward. Forward, let's just go over it step by step. First, systems in Bavi are really just functions that receive special parameters. In this case, we're receiving the command buffer, which is a struct on Bavi used to create impactful changes in the game world. For instance, spawning or despawning entities. Then we actually need to spawn a camera so we can see our player. If we don't do that, the game screen will just be black. So we're using the commands buffer to spawn a new entity using the camera 2D bundle. Bundles are really just a convenience to add multiple components at once. In this case, the camera 2D bundle adds a lot of components that represents a camera. Then we finally spawn our player using the same command spawn function. You can see down here that we're adding the paddle component to the player, the one we created a few moments ago, and then adding a sprite bundle to the player entity. Similar to the camera 2D bundle, the sprite bundle is just a group of components that represents a sprite. In this case, we're setting the transform, which is the position, rotation, and scale of our player. That's using the constant that we created up here, and the rest is just the default values for this component. Same for the sprite, we choose a sprite color, and set the sprite custom size to the paddle size. Custom size is an option, vector2, which is why we need to wrap paddle size into this sum keyword. Let's also make sure to go up here and add bevy.math so we have access to those functions like vec3, vec2, etc. Finally, I'll just add a clear color resource so we can have a bright gray background instead of a black background. If you run the project again, you should see our player right in the middle of the screen. Let's now see how we can move our player using keyboard input. I'll add a new concept for the paddle speed and a new system on fixed Fixed update called move paddle. Fixed update is just like the update, but it always runs on a fixed rate. In the case of Bavi, by default, it's 60 frames per second. Finally, let's go to the bottom of our file and look at the move paddle system step by step. This system uses two resources, the input and the time step resource. Resources in Bavi are global data that can be widely accessed. Basically, they're singletones. In the case of the input resource, this gives access to the keyboard inputs, and the time step gives us access to the frame time and the total elapsed time. And if you're curious, 
use, those resources are added by Navi default plugins. For instance, you can see here that that input plugin adds the input key code resource. Finally, and most importantly, we have a query. Query is what we use in ECS to find entities that match a set of components. In this case, we're looking for any entity that matches the transform component and the paddle component. In other words, our player. We're also specifying that we want to write to the transform component by using a multiple reference and that we're interested in entities with the paddle component, but we're not interested in the data in this component, which actually makes sense since our paddle component has no data. Now, because we know we only have one player in our game, we can get a transform component by using query single mode. This will crash the game if there is more than one entity matching this query, so use it with caution. Then we capture the player's input in this variable direction, which is going to be minus one if the player presses A or plus one if the player presses D. Then we find the new X position by getting the current X position and adding the direction times the paddle speed times the current frame delta time. This will be one over 60 for the fixed update and it ensures that the player will always move at the same speed regardless of the machine that the game is running or if we change the fixed update rate. Finally, we just write to the transform component by sending the X coordinate to new X. If you run the game again, you should be able to move the player. Now we're ready to add our ball. And if you've been following along, you might find this very similar to our player. I'll go ahead and add some constants to represent our ball, such as the color, position, size, and the speed. Then I'll add two components, one tag component to represent the ball, and one velocity component to represent the ball's velocity. Now, if we go back to the setup function, we can create our ball using commands.span. Similar to the player, we have a sprite bundle with a transform and a sprite, the ball tag component, and the velocity component, which in this case is the ball speed times the ball initial direction. Going back to the main function, let's add a new system to fix it update called apply velocity. And now here, let's create this system. You can see that we have a query for transform and the velocity component. We're going to write to the transform, but only read the velocity. And as usual, we also query for the time step resource. Here we get the frame time by using time step f 32 Then here we see a more common way to access component data in ECS. Instead of using query.singlemoot, we're looping through every entity in this query. And for every entity, we're getting the transform and the velocity component. After that, we just need to add velocity times dt for both the x and the y coordinates. If you run the game again, you should see a square ball falling down the screen. If we set the velocity to zero for a bit, it should not be easier to see our square ball. But how can we make our ball look, well, more like a ball? In any game, sprites are really just quads, that means squares, that you can render a texture to. So if we want our ball to look more like a ball, we really just need to use a circle texture. You can find this on Google, and I left the link I use in the description of this video. To load the texture, create a new folder called Assets, and then another folder called Textures, and put the circle texture inside. The naming inside the Assets folder can be anything you want, but you do have to call the root folder Assets, as Bevy will look for this name. Then, back on the setup function, we can add the Asset Server resource, which is a shared resource that we can use to load assets. Then, before spawning our ball, we just load the texture using asset server.load. Then, on our sprite bundle, we just set the texture as our ball texture. And if you run the game again, we have a round ball. Let's start limiting the First Amendment rights of this ball by trapping it into a box. As usual, I'll add some constants here. The first four define the positions of each wall, and the last four define its size and color. For the components, we're actually going to add a wall bundle that by itself will contain a sprite bundle and a collider component that we created here. We're not going to implement collisions right away, but we're going to need this component really soon. Then, on our setup function, we can paste all this code to create our walls. Again, it does feel like a lot of code, but if we go over it step by step, it's not that hard. First, when I usually have a lot of code in a function, I tend to create a scope for it. This is just to make it easier to know when it starts and when it ends, and also to factor this code into a function if I need to. On a high level, we're really just defining the size for our vertical wall and our horizontal wall, and then using commands.spawn to spawn each wall. Let's go over how it works. For the vertical and horizontal sizes, we really just have a block that is very thin on one dimension. For the vertical one, we have a wall thickness, which is the smaller dimension on the x-axis. For the horizontal wall size, we have the opposite. Then, for the other dimension, we use the wall block height or wall block width plus the wall thickness so they fit together nicely. For context, the wall block height is just the top wall position minus the bottom wall position. And similarly, the wall block width is a right wall position minus the left wall position. Now going to the spawn entity code, we're spawning an entity with a wall bundle, which itself contains a sprite bundle and a collider. The sprite bundle, as you might expect, has a position, which in this case is the left wall position, a sprite with a wall color, and a custom size of vertical wall size for the left wall, and the rest is pretty much the default. Finally, we add the collider, for which the size will just be the same size of the sprite. If you look at the other wall spawning code, it's pretty much the same. For the right wall, we change the position, and we keep the same vertical 
vertical size. For the bottom and top wall, we also change the position, in this case on the Y axis, and the size will be the horizontal wall size. If you run the game now, you should see our trap box. However, it's not really trapping anyone at the moment. So let's add collision to fix that. Let's start by adding collision to the move paddle function, which will limit the movement of our player. Calling this collision is a little bit of a stretch, but let's roll with it. The only thing we need to do is really add those two lines after new X and before we write to the transform. We also need to change new X to a movable variable so we can write to it after its initial assignment. What we're doing here is really just clamping the X position so it doesn't go greater than the right wall position or smaller than the left wall position. But of course, because these positions are on the center of the sprite, we need to take into account the wall thickness and the pedal size. But really that's all you need to limit the position of the player. And if you play our game now, you should be able to see that. Let's now implement a more interesting collision routine for the ball. First, go to the main function and add a new system called check ball collision. And in this case, we want to tell Bavi that we want this system to run after the apply velocity system. We will also need to go to the ball component and add a size to it. So we know how to collide the ball and really anything else with a collider component. Now go to the end of the file and let's implement the check ball collision. As usual, we have a function with a couple of special parameters. In this case, we have two queries, one for the ball. And in this query, we want to write the velocity and read the transform and the ball component. The other query is for any entity with a transform and a collider component. Now we iterate over every ball entity, grabbing its velocity, transform, and the ball component. And inside, we have an asset loop for the other collider and its transform. The function responsible for calculating the collision is this function called collide, which is actually inside Bevy is sprite collide AABB. So let's import this up here and actually use the asterisk so we import everything. This collide function is really just a workaround of Bevy because they don't have a physics system yet. And simply what it does is it just receives a position and a size for the two objects you want to check collision for and returns a collision medium that just tells you if the collision is from the left, right, top, bottom, or inside. And if there is no collision, you will just return none. So we use this function by passing the ball translation, the ball size, and the other entity translation and size. Now the rest of the code just reflects the ball velocity if it hits a wall. So here we have variables for reflecting on the x-axis or the y-axis. And if we do have a collision, we reflect the ball velocity depending on the collision side and the current velocity. If the ball is to the left of the collision and we're moving to the right, we want to reflect our velocity to the left. Similarly, if the ball is to the right of the collision and we're moving to the left, we want to reflect the velocity to the right. Very important, the collision enum will depend on the order you pass the entities to the function and it's always going to return the side that the first object is in the collision. In this case, we are getting the side that the ball is at. Finally, if we want to reflect the velocity, we just multiply the respective axis by minus one. Finally, before testing our code, we need to go back to the setup function when we're creating the ball and making sure that we now add the ball size to the component. I'll also add back the velocity so the ball moves again. And if you're running your game, you'll see the ball colliding with the walls. And just to show you how flexible the ECS architecture can be, you can see here that the ball and the paddle do not collide and making them collide should be as easy as going to the paddle spawn function and just add the collider component with the paddle size. And now you can see that the ball is colliding with our paddle. And just to show you how it's scalable Bevy can be, here's 100,000 balls running at 60 frames per second. Bevy can handle probably much more than that, but I felt like stopping at a nice round number. Let's continue by adding bricks to our game. As usual, I'll add some constants here for the brick size, brick color, and the distances between the brick and the walls and the bricks themselves. On the component side, technically we don't need any more components for this, but I'm going to create a brick tag component as this will help us when we implement the score system. Now let's go to the setup function and go over the code for the bricks. This code may look a little bit intimidating at first, but it's really not that hard when we have some diagrams. First, we calculate the offset for the first brick on the X and the Y axis. This is really just the left wall plus the gap between the bricks and the wall that we just defined here, plus half the brick size. Again, that's because the spike coordinates in Bevy is on the center, and the logic is similar for the offset Y. Then, we want to calculate the brick's total width and height that we can use to calculate the rows and columns. The total width will just be the difference between the right wall and left wall positions, minus the gap between the bricks and the sides on each side, so times two. Same idea for the bricks total height, but in this case we have different values for the top and bottom, so we just subtract both here. Then we can find the rows by dividing the total height by the size of each brick on the y-axis plus the gap between bricks. We floor this value and cast it to an integer. The same logic applies for the columns. Then it's really just a matter of iterating on all the rows and columns and spawning the brick. Here we calculate the brick position by using the offset x and y and adjusting it according to the row and column. Basically 
quickly, the position of the brick on X will be the column index starting from zero times the brick size on X plus the gap between the bricks. And the same logic applies for Y. And finally, we just spawn the entity with the regular sprite bundle and collider setup. And of course, we also add the brick component to identify our bricks. On our check ball collision system, we actually want to despawn the brick when the ball hits. So we're going to add the commands buffer. And also on the collider query, we're going to add an option for the brick. This means this query will match any entity that has a transform and collider. And optionally, it could have or not have the brick component. We also add the entity itself to the query so we can properly despawn it. Here on the for loop over the collider query, let's make sure to update our variables. So we have the entity and the brick option. Then if we collide with an entity and this entity is a brick, we can call commands.entity despawn. Before running the game, let's just go up here and change the pedal start y to be 60 pixels above the bottom wall. And if you run your game, we actually have a playable breakout loop. And we're almost done. We just need to add some score y and some sound. Let's start with the score. As usual, we add some constants for the scoreboard. And then we're actually going to create a resource for our score. As a reminder, a resource is really just some data that is unique and globally accessible. Then don't forget to go to your main function and add the scoreboard as a resource. Now on our check ball collision function, we can grab a multiple reference to the scoreboard. And if we hit a brick, we can add one to the score. And let's also print the score so we can see that it's working. And if you run your game, you should see the score increasing every time we hit a brick. For the score UI, let's go to the bottom of the setup function and spawn an entity for the UI text. There is a lot about UI on Bavi and in games in general, which I plan to do a video about. But for now, you only need to understand that we're spawning an entity with a text bundle component. The text bundle itself has a component called text that contains an array of several text sections. This is so it's easier for you to edit a specific part of the text if you want to. In our case, we're going to have two sections. The first one is just for the score that will never change. And the second one is for the value of the score, which we'll set using the score resource in a bit. Finally, we add a style that tells Bavi how to position and also how this UI should look. In our case, we're only worried about position. We're choosing an absolute position type, which just means that we're going to position this UI with a world position, just like any object in the world. And then we're setting the top left positions to the constants up here. Finally, on our main function, we can add another system to the update called update scoreboard. This system is super simple. We just get the score resource and a query for the text components. In this case, we're assuming there is going to be only one text component in our game, which is not very safe, but we can live with it for now. And then we're setting the value of the second section to the value of our score. And if you run the game, you can see the score UI on the top left and also see that it's updating every time our score changes. Now to add sounds to our game, we will need to add the sound file under asset sounds. And you'll also find the link for this in the description. Then create a new resource named collision sound that contains a handle to an audio source. Then on the setup function, you can load the sound file using asset server.load and then insert the collision sound resource. Then on our check ball collision system, we can just grab a reference to the collision sound resource. And every time there is a collision, we can play a sound by spawning an entity with an audio bundle. Also make sure to set the despawn as a playback settings so the entity is automatically cleaned up after the audio plays. And if you run the game now, you should see a sound playing every time you hit a brick or a wall. Now, if you like this video, but you wish we didn't have to write so many constants, or maybe you didn't have to restart the game for every change, make sure to subscribe to the channel because I plan to add many more videos, including how to turn Bav into a full flat editor using eGUI and how to improve iteration times using hot reloading. Let me know what videos you'd like to see on the comment sections below and thanks for watching.